in the multi-layer perceptor networks, the idea was that when you feed an input data point to the network, you are going to have all of the hidden units activate, some of them to a larger extent than others, but anyway, all of them um, participate in the computation and cooperate in some way um, to classifying or to um, outputting a value for that particular input uh, data point. And so the, the whole idea there is that you have all of these hidden units cooperating in some uh, well-defined way to say something about that input data point. Now, the idea of competitive learning, in fact, can also be brought to this sort of um, uh, neural networks, multi-layer perceptrons and, and their deeper versions. Um, and it can be brought in the form of saying, well, how about if only a small part of the hidden un units get activated and not the other ones, and only those that are really similar to the input data point get to activate themselves and the other ones don't. And this is the concept that is being brought forward by the radial basis function networks. So if you are comparing the uh, idea of uh, the multilayer perceptrons in there, the computation that was done by a hidden unit was essentially a multiplicative um, uh, computation. It, there was a um, uh, weight associated to each hidden unit and there was a dot product plus some bias. And the geometrical interpretation of such a computation is that each hidden point in fact uh, defines um, defines a um, uh, hyperplane and the activation of that hidden unit is essentially saying whether the current data point is on the positive side of that hyperplane or not. And so you have all of these hidden um, units and each one of them defines a hyperplane and by um, you know, looking on which side of all of these hyperplanes your data point is, you are going to be able to say something about that data point and, and classify it or, or calculate an output. But there is this kind of global cooperative um, contribution of, of all these hidden units that brings you something um, in terms of an output for this data point. Now, so this is a, a so-called distributed representation. All of these hidden units represent something um, about your data point and uh, it's done in a distributed way. Each one of them has, has a saying uh, on, on that data point. Now, the other way of thinking about it is that you have in fact a local representation. In fact, each one of these hidden units only says something about data points that are nearby and it doesn't say anything. In fact, they don't get activated if the data points are further away um, from their um, uh, center. And <clears throat> so you have, uh, th this is something that we've seen before, um, also in um, uh, resonance ad ad adaptive theory and in online k-means, where you have this idea that each hidden unit is a sort of a hypersphere and you are going to get it activated only for those input data points that fall within this hypersphere. So they are very close to the center of, of that particular cluster and it doesn't get activated for points that are outside of that hypersphere. So this is the idea of a local representation. Each, each hidden unit only gives a local representation, only gets activated for data points that are nearby. And so in multi-layer perceptrons and in their deeper versions in, in deep neural networks, you have this idea of distributed representation. You have this simultaneous activation of many hidden units. And, and out of this simultaneous activation, you get the computation of um, the um, uh, perceptron network. And so the alternative is uh, a local representation for a um, give an input, there are only a few hidden units that get activated. And so we get to define uh, this notion of receptive field of a hidden unit and that's defined as the part of the input space that stimulates it or it causes it to get activated. And so this, uh, this kind of concept, this kind of definition has a, a motivation in a similarity to the human brain where certain types of stimuli activate only certain regions of, of the brain. And we have seen, in fact, this concept um, in, uh, in uh, structured in, in a different way in self-organizing maps. 
Um, and so the question here is, I mean, if you want to work with, with such a concept in the framework of um, uh, deep neural networks, the question is, how do you activate uh, only a few hidden units? Uh, and then you, you only activate those that are most similar to the current input. And so you have to drop this idea that that is going to be a sort of a multiplicative um, computation as, as done in multilayer perceptrons and rather adapt something else. The computation done by a hidden unit is going to be in fact based on this kind of Gaussian function. Um, and so what we have in here is, this is the current input, this is the current data point xt, and the hidden unit is going to have a weight vector of the same, di same dimension as the uh, input data point, and you're going to get the norm uh, squared. In other words, you're going to check how close uh, is this data point to the weight of this hidden unit. And you also divide to a parameter here, which is specific to this hidden unit, which in some sense, if you think about the hypersphere um, intuition that I gave on the previous slide, this is going to play the role of this activation radius. Uh, this is also called the spread of this uh, hidden unit uh, age. And um, if you think visually, I mean, how this um, uh, Gaussian function looks like, um, I have here this visualization for uh, m equals zero and, and for a spread equal to one. The good point about using such a function is that it's going to achieve obviously its maximum level. In other words, its maximum, maximum activation for this hidden unit um, exactly at its center, uh, exactly at this uh, m h. And it's going to decrease very quickly as you have input data points that are further away from the m h. And that's exactly what we wanted um, conceptually, we wanted to have an activation mechanism that gives you <clears throat> high activation uh, close to um, this vector represented by this hidden unit, and it doesn't really get activated or, or gets activated very little as you are further away from, from that vector. So <clears throat> if you think in terms of um, this kind of uh, layered architecture that we typically have in, in multi-layer perceptrons or in deep neural networks, you have um, here the input layer and you have as many units as you have features in your data set. And uh, uh, speaking of uh, multi-layer perceptron, there is only one layer of hidden units and then you have the output layer. And in these hidden units, the computation that's being done is based on this sort of Gaussian function that we had also on the previous slide. Um, rather than the multiplicative uh, sort of computation that we had in the standard version of uh, multilayer perceptrons. And so for different inputs, uh, this is going to get, um, is going to lead to activation of just a few uh, hidden units, uh, not all of them, and in fact, uh, only those that are quite similar to the uh, input data point are going to get activated and, and not the other one. Now, if you think about the whole computation of this um, uh, sort of network, these are called radial basis function networks um, uh, because the activation uh, function is, is called a uh, uh, radial basis function. So <clears throat> the computation is, is very similar to that of multilayer perceptrons. The only point here is that um, these activation functions of the layer of hidden units are going to, are going to be based on this sort of radial base function um, uh, and, and not on multiplicative um, uh, functions. But other than that, the second um, uh, layer, the output layer, uh, the way it's connected to the hidden layer, it's exactly the same as before. You are going to have some interconnections and they will have their own weights and, and you will also have a bias. In, in this sort of um, uh, RBF or radial basis function networks, uh, most people use them with just one layer of, of, uh, of Gaussian uh, units. And so the, the question then is, how are you going to train such a network? So you have your um, uh, data set and you feed these uh, data points through the network. And um, in the output, you are going to uh, have a sort of an error function and you want to back propagate this error function and update uh, you know, the parameters of your layers. And so you can do that in at least two different ways. One is a sort of a hybrid learning. The other one is a fully supervised learning. The hybrid learning idea is that <clears throat> when you compute this uh, hidden layer, in other words, when you compute these uh, radial base functions, you, you need to compute the 
um, mean of each one of those um, radial base function and, and the spread. And in fact, this is what unsupervised uh, online k-means was doing. And so you could you could think about you know doing an unsupervised learning for the first layer. You are going to compute. Um, you know, how many uh, hidden units you need, uh, and that's going to correspond to how many clusters you have in your data points, and you're going to compute the centers and the spreads um, based on radial base function using just, uh, you know, unsupervised k-means. So that's going to fix your layer of hidden units and, and all its parameters, and then you only focus the learning on the second um, uh, layer of your network, uh, the one connecting the output layer with the hidden uh, units. And on that one, you can do <clears throat> a supervised gradient descent. Uh, you are going ju to just focus on updating the weights of those interactions between the output layer and the, and the hidden layer um, and apply traditional you know, um, uh, supervised gradient descent. The other possibility is that, in fact, you are going to do a fully supervised uh, learning, uh, meaning that you are going to back propagate also through the hidden layer unit and you are going to update in some way the mean and the spread of all of those radial base functions corresponding to the hidden layer uh, units. I'm skipping in this uh, lecture the update rule for this uh, fully supervised learning um, they are in the textbook and, and they can be easily derived with the basic observation that RBF, so radial base functions, are not a problem for uh, backpropagation because they are differentiable. So the same kind of reasoning that we've had before when we reasoned about the uh, update rule in gradient descent in um, multilayer perceptrons is going to apply here, it's just that the derivative uh, is going to be a little bit different. And so <clears throat> in the backpropagation step, the update rule is going to concern both the second layer of the networks, the weights um, uh, of the links uh, from the first layer, and as well as the first layer, that means the Gaussian uh, units. And the exact backpropagation back rule, as usually, is going to depend on the error function that you are choosing. For example, if you have a regression problem, you might want to choose the sum of squares, or if you have a classification problem, uh, you might want to choose a cross entropy error and obviously that's going to give you a different sort of uh, derivatives and, and that's going to modify a little bit the uh, update rule you have your, for your learning but the concept is the same it's going to be a fully supervised learning um, based on the error function that you are choosing and based on calculating carefully the uh, derivatives of your error function and of the uh, radial base uh, functions